back to the Justice Conference Asia 2016. I'm here with Troy Anderson. You've been telling us uh, your international director of Speak Up. You've been talking about uh, Bangladesh and some of the initiatives there. Um, you talked about 300 million potentially girls who are, who are sort of at risk. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Yeah, so I use just roughly a number out of 7.4 billion people in the world, 300 million girls that because they're poor are at risk of some kind of exploitation. And that might be something as simple as being dropped out of a school to something as severe as at risk of being trafficked into sex slavery of something, some form or um, forced into an illegal child marriage. So there's a lot of different forms of exploitation of girls, but I would say 300, 400 million, there's a massive pool of girls who are at risk just because they're poor. And you talked a lot about child marriage, and, and I guess yeah. that's not, we, we hear a lot about sex trafficking and these types yeah. of exploitation, but we don't hear a lot about child marriage. And you talked about how your program, Speak Up, is really about educating, and it feels yeah. like it's child marriage versus education. Yeah. Why is education the solution, do you think? Well, education is the solution for girls because if a girl is 13 years old and she's considered a burden to the family and she has no option, she's going to be dropped out of school, married when she's 13 or 14, and just mired in poverty for the rest of her life. So the alternative to that, if a girl is 13 or 14, she needs to do something. And the way to build a better future for her and her family, to marry a better husband, to just um, be healthier, to have healthier children, everything is to have an education so she can have a job and she'll understand uh, maternal care, she'll understand how to have healthy children, she'll raise her children as educated. So really, um, girls' education is gonna change everything in that, out of that pool of poverty. But the, the culture inside of these villages, it, it very much supports sort of this child marriage thing. So, so how do you, as you spend time in the villages working, how do you go, it's such a countercultural thing uh, to go in there with this sort of mentality and to empower these girls to sort of, and you even shared stories about them rising up against their dad and, and saying, no, I, I won't be married. Yeah. Um, how do you balance that type of sort of countercultural type of um, mentality? Yeah. Well, um, most of the fathers, there's kind of two issues. One is kind of culture and religion and their tradition. And the other side of it for them is just pure economic reality. So to some of the fathers, you need to speak about to their religion and their culture and their understanding of women. But sometimes it's simply something like, my daughter's a burden because I can't pay for her school. But if I can say, here's all the economic benefits to you. She'll marry a better man. She'll have a job. You won't pay a dowry, right? Her kids will be healthy. There won't be the medical bills. All the economic benefits that dads sometimes say, oh, it actually just economically makes sense, right? Besides the cultural issues and the fact like he just wants to actually love his daughter. So sometimes you have to speak to the pure, rational self-interest of a dad and say, if you like paying dowry, go ahead. But if we educate your daughter, She's going to marry a better man. Her children will be healthier. There's a hundred different ways that economically it's going to be better for you. And dads, they're not stupid. Poor men, they might not have, they might be uneducated. They might not have much, but they hear that language. And then you just have to map out how it's actually going to work for them. And obviously we know in Bangladesh there's a caste system, which you talked about. And, yeah, well, and they're in India and it kind of parts in the Hindu caste system bleeding into Bangladesh, although it's illegal and technically doesn't exist, but some people just by their last name, they know that they're descendants of the Dalits, the untouchable castes. So what do you think is going to happen? I mean, you talked about sort of some of the girls now have been in this program are, are starting going to university, going to be graduating. What do you think is, is going to happen um, once this, this group of girls have been empowered uh, start to get back into society then? Yeah, well, they're going to get jobs that are going to allow them to marry educated men have healthier lives and go back and bring resources to their village. And they're gonna influence the next generation. So my 10 girls in university, they're gonna go back and influence the next 100. And 10 years from now, those 100, the next 1,000. And one day, you're gonna have villages now where 95% of the girls are married when they're 13 or 14. The villages where we work, it's gonna switch and it's gonna be 95% of them at least finish 12th grade and 50, 60% that go and get a real job. It's gonna completely change the society. It's incredible. It's very exciting. Troy, thanks so much for uh, being at the Justice Conference, and thanks yeah. for taking some time with yeah. us. Awesome. You're welcome. Thanks.